everyone. My name is Tessa, and today I'll be talking to you about writing your own programming language. So where to start? Well, one way you can start is by thinking of solutions to existing problems. For example, a language that addresses frustrating aspects of another language you already know, or a language that solves problems in a specific domain. You want to start by defining rules at three different levels. The first one is the lexical level. What determines what a word is? What are some legal data types, for example, strings or integers? At the syntactic level, what, level, what are legal and grammatical combinations of words? For example, what makes a valid expression or a valid statement? And finally, at a semantic level, this is potentially the most language-specific part. What do the tokens mean and how do we process them? How do you figure out what a legal program does? In other words, what is it telling the computer to do? The parts of the language can be broken down into four stages and processes. The code, lexing, tokens, parsing, nodes, interpreting, or compiling, and finally objects and runtime. So the first part is the code itself. For example, our classic Hello World program. Then we get into the lexer, which is also known as a scanner, which is also known as a tokenizer. And this converts inputs or code into tokens, which are the building blocks that parsers can understand. What are tokens? Well, they are objects tagged with type and value to ease the parser's workload. You can make a lexer using pre-existing tools, and the advantage of using such a generator is that it would probably run faster than a lexer that you wrote yourself, and it has built-in error handling. But the advantage of making your own lexer is that it's less likely to require context-free grammar, which can cause some weird edge cases during parsing. So this is an example of some JavaScript tokens for our Hello World program. The next step is to build the parser, which takes the input data, again the code, and contextualizes its tokens in a structured tree while checking the syntax for errors. Also importantly, it establishes an order of operator precedence. Data is usually represented in something called an abstract syntax tree, in which the nodes represent what the code means to the language, or the syntax and it doesn't represent every single detail, which is why it's called an abstract syntax tree. So this is an example of what an abstract syntax tree might look like for our Hello World program. There are pre-existing tools to generate parsers too. An advantage to using a generator here is that it's a lot less work to make a parser, and if you don't know what you're doing, your parser will run a lot faster. But on the other hand, advantages to rolling your own is that if you know what you're doing, your parser can be a lot faster and more specific to your language. The next step, we have a crossroads. Do we want to interpret or compile? Well, an interpreter analyzes code more swiftly, but executes it more slowly. It lives in the present. In other words, it uses less memory. On the other hand, a compiler analyzes code more slowly, but it executes it more quickly. It remembers the past. In other words, it uses a lot more memory. In more detail, an interpreter evaluates the AST nodes, often using something called a visitor pattern. And a visitor pattern involves a visitor class that is an operation that processes each node on the AST without altering the node itself or even knowing what kind of data each node possesses. But another way is to let each node how to know how to handle itself instead. Meanwhile, a compiler translates one language into another. For example, think of Google Translate and how it translates German into Japanese or how an HTML rendering engine will translate HTML into a visible website. But typically when we talk about compilers, we talk about translating high-level languages to low-level languages. Again, with compilation, we have a choice. We have two options for compilation, which are ahead-of-time compilation, which is slower to process, but faster to run, or just-in-time compilation, which is a balance of speed and processing and execution. And JavaScript utilizes just-in-time compilation, also known as JIT. Uh, you can also create a compiler using a generator. Finally, we have runtime, which is how the language is represented in memory. In other words, what it does. And this is all about finding a balance between three conflicting goals, which are speed. How efficiently does it run? Flexibility. The more a user can modify the language within itself, especially, the more powerful it is. And finally, memory footprint, which you always want to be as small as possible. There are various runtime models, and JavaScript is prototype-based, which is the easiest type of model to implement, and it's very flexible because everything is a clone of an object. Finally, it's time to get serious and get down to the moment you've all been waiting for. Cats! 
So now I'm going to show you a live coding demo of this programming language called Law Code. Yeah. Okay. So first, every programming language opens with hi and the version number, which is currently 1.2, and then closes with OK, thanks, bye. There are six different kinds of data types in law code, which are the new, which is an untyped data type, the true, which is a Boolean, <laughs> and they have win, which is true, and fail, which is false. Number is an int, and num bar is a float. We have the most adorable data type, which is a yarn, a string, and finally, bucket, oops, which is an array. And this, by the way, is an example of a block comment. So you can see if I run it, nothing happens because we commented it out. OK, so first of all, let's try declaring and logging a variable. So we can start by saying, I has a bar. So now we have this bar that is null and untyped. And this is an example of a single line comment. And then I want to assign it a value. So I'll say var r hello world. And finally, I'll log it with visible var. There you go, hello world. OK, we can also reassign type. So if I has a float and it's 5.5 and you can see that it's a float. Yep. Now, if I say float is now a number, you can see it's been recast to the number with no E type or the ins type. We can also add new lines with really cute smiley faces. So if I has a bar and it's pull, let's say, and then I say visible, hello, I am a new line, I am tabbed, I am inter bar aided. Hello, I am a new line, I am tabbed, and I am interpolated. Finally, I want to demonstrate to you my favorite aspect of the language, which is an if statement. So first we start with our condition, our predicate, both same for and, and five. This is saying, oh, are four and five equal? <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, really. This is our if. And then if it is, well, visible, it really was. But then, maybe we want an else if case. And finally, our else case. And you close this block with, oh, I see. <laughs> OK. So who thinks, with a show of hands, that we will get, it really was? OK. How about maths? All right. Finally, all lies. All right. Let's find out, guys. Math. OK, so in our maybe, we have an example of replacing a value with an expression. So what it does is, instead of having a number here, it evaluates the sum of 5 and 5, which is 10, and then says, is 5 and 5 10? Are they the same? And they are. Let me show you just one more thing before I close the demo, and that is that you can also concatenate strings with the smoosh operator. So if I say hi and grace, Got a little too excited. Hopper and hi and full stack. Now this is an example of a an expression that can take multiple lengths. So I need to be able to tell law code when I'm done. And I do that by saying, okay. There you go. Hi Grace Hopper. Hi full stack. So that concludes the demo. Okay. So to recap. 
Law code is a language created by a researcher at Lancaster University's computing department named Adam Lindsay in 2007. And the problem he was looking to solve was that there's not enough kitten pigeon in our lives, and he felt that that was just not right. The specs in the most recent interpreter are maintained by a Facebook research scientist named Justin Meza, and he wrote the interpreter in C. The language can be Turing complete, which in this case means that it supports branching if statements, can maintain an arbitrary number of variables, and can approximately simulate the computational aspects of other real-world general purpose languages. It's classified as an esoteric language, which means a language that's designed to experiment with weird ideas, etc., instead of having a practical use. But it's arguably a weird lang, and according to the Etholang wiki, which is a wiki dedicated to this kind of thing, and I quote, a weird lang is, depending on who you ask, either A, a type of esoteric programming language, or B, something that idiots think is a type of esoteric programming language that really isn't. So, to <laughs> sum up, a weird lang is typically just a normal language with weird syntax, but nothing else truly esoteric about it. And that concludes my talk for today. Okay, thanks, bye! <laughs>